Who knew an instrumental Pitbull song and carriages would have women across the world going feral in the year of 2024? Apparently Shonda Rhimes did, baby, because we're talking Bridgerton season three today. Hey y'all, my name is Sasha Raquel, and today we are going to talk about the highly anticipated, the highly enjoyed, the highly talked about Bridgerton season three. I feel like at this point it's impossible to not know about Bridgerton, but for those of you who have tuned out because it's been literally two years since technically the last season of Bridgerton, let me catch you up to speed about what season three is all about. After years of pining over Colin Bridgerton, new family dynamics have left wallflower Penelope Featherington no choice but to take a husband. But when Colin offers her lessons in charm, he finds himself unable to think about anything more than his sister's best friend. So Mm, okay, tropes, baby. If for some reason, again, you're still unaware, we have friends to lovers. We have best friends brother. We have years of pining. Like we have, she fell first, he fell harder. Like that's what we're dealing with. I'm going to try to avoid any specific scene spoilers because I'll be making plenty of content during our little hiatus until part two, which speaking of the part separation, I feel as though this was the season to kick it off with. I had read the book prior to going into the season and there's very naturally two different storylines going on in this season, which we have our typical romance storyline, but we also have the Lady Whistledown plot, which is something that I think is gonna be further explored in part two, based on what we've seen thus far. The novel has a very natural half and half of the book. There's kind of a pre the couple getting together and a post the couple getting together and how that has different implications on each of the main characters, as well as their relationship as a whole and all the other characters in the story, as well as the fact that this has, if you've seen, all of part one, there's a very natural cliffhanger point that is like a positive cliffhanger point and not a negative one. Either could have worked for the season, like people are still going to show back up for part two. But the beauty of this specific story that's being told is you can kind of dose the, the tension that the viewer is feeling into two separate halves. If you've seen the show, you kind of probably can pick up what I'm putting down here. I've seen a lot of critiques about this season specifically. I think the chief critique here, which I think has some some level of like validity is the fact that there's a lot of storylines going on. For the type of show this is, like we're dealing with a family with eight siblings and there's only so much you can spare certain siblings doing without giving them a more elevated storyline. And I think this season, to be honest, I feel like it's done a pretty good job. The one storyline I would say that feels a bit out of place, a bit like unnecessary is Benedict's storyline. And it's not because I don't love Benedict, but I think it's because it's time for Benedict season. I have a theory that Benedict is going to be next. I have a theory that the end of the season is gonna end in a very specific type of ball. And I feel like his storyline, because we have already kind of set aside his art storyline at the end of season two, for very specific purposes for his specific season, it's time for him to have his own story, which is something that I think is the reason we got Colin season now and we're going out of order and we didn't go straight into Benedict season is because the showrunners have specifically said they were tired of dealing with the writing dynamic of Penelope being in love with Colin and Colin not recognizing it, that that was just getting tiresome and unrealistic for them. And so I really commend them for figuring out what was best for the characters, but I do feel like this season now we're feeling like, okay, Benedict needs a little bit more purpose. And while I do like that his storyline is allowing for kind of a different eye on the ton, I definitely just think it's a way to like add a new character. And I don't know that it's really gonna have anything else to pay off, but to be fair, that's what happened with Anthony and Sienna in season one. Like that was an entire storyline that to my understanding is only briefly referenced in the books and was kind of added to get you acquainted with Anthony so that when his season came along. By now, by when we're talking about going into season four, people are well acquainted with Benedict. Trust me, the Benedict girlies are begging. So I think that's what's coming up next. But overall, the rest of the storylines I think have been handled really well. Like even though, as my sweatshirt will tell you, I literally could have gone for a full another season that's just focused on Kane and Anthony. Like literally everybody else could be on vacation and it could just be them in Aubrey Hall, like dealing with being Viscount and Viscount S. I would have eaten it up. We all know I would have, but I think it was really great how they have given Canthony fans more than what they saw in trailers, added cute little newlywed epilogue-ish scenes for them, and yet sidelined them in a really natural, beautiful way so that the focus can be on the main couple rather than being like, oh, we're competing with last season's couple because this is the first season when we've really been able to have this dynamic and I think they've handled it really well. Another one of the storylines that I think is being handled really well because it's very intrinsically linked into 
the plot that they've woven in the show that has slightly deviated from the books, which is the Colin, the Eloise, and the Penelope kind of dynamic. Them as a trio is funny, like rewatching past seasons, you realize how many times they really are introduced as a trio. Penelope wanting to be a Bridgerton and wanting to be close with Eloise and feeling comfortable at the Bridgerton home is part of what she's gonna be able to accomplish with getting together with Colin. This has been something that's been really interestingly also created another triangle of conflict between Eloise, Cressida, and Penelope. I feel like that storyline really in like a special way showcases like how sometimes female friendships can be difficult. Sometimes your best friend and you have a falling out. It kind of feels like a part of you is missing and you both want to care for one another and be there for each other, but you kind of also are still mad at that person and hurt by them. I think it's really interesting to see that play out in a Regency style, especially when you add in the kind of different dynamics of privilege, wealth, feminine agency. Eloise is kind of moving more towards wanting love. We can see that through her reading Emma and stuff, which is like such a nice touch that's giving enough breadcrumbs. And I feel like Eloise, the reason she also won't be next is there's enough to do with her character for another season to not have to give her season right away, if you know what I mean. But I feel like this exploration with Cressida is really interesting because at the same time we're seeing how she can be cruel to Penelope and how that dynamic plays out we can also see how there's maybe redemption for her down the line the other major plot which this season some people could argue wasn't necessary is Francesca's plot Francesca's presentation into society does feel a little bit like a nostalgia play or a level of an element of the Bridgerton story that has always been there which is like Daphne is presented then Eloise was presented now Francesca is being presented and that's how each season has sort of started knowing what I know of Francesca's story in the Bridgerton books and how her season will eventually play out introducing not only the new actress that plays Francesca but giving her a more important storyline this season for it to kind of play in the background in a few important ways before her time comes up very much makes sense and I don't want to elaborate that because that's a book spoiler that is not even close to being touched I don't think in the Bridgerton series but what are we really here to talk about? We're really here to talk about pollen. We're really here to talk about them. I really personally feel that they have great chemistry and I think you can see it very specifically in the scene at the end of episode four, not just in their physical intimacy, but in there's a part where they laugh and you'll know exactly what I'm talking about at the end of that episode. And it really, to me, encapsulates what is so beloved about like the friends to lover trope in romance novels tv shows movies it's this level of somebody understanding you and you unlocking this new side to your life and relationship that kind of makes it feel complete and have something you've never dreamed of and it's kind of just amazing i feel like such a hopeless romantic saying this but in that scene specifically which is always the one that's going to get pointed to because right now it's the cliffhanger of the season that we have as well as the fact that it's such a beloved scene from the books but the way in which it is handled i think you can just see nicola coughlin and luke newton's chemistry their off-screen friendship how they've been able to over the course of three separate seasons of bridgerton now bring their character story to life and i think there's plenty more that we're gonna get to see a second half of the season which i'm so excited about honestly i had a really good freaking time with this season okay i had a really good freaking time with this four episodes i ate them up i've continued to re-eat them like i've reheated it out of my fridge leftovers better the next day you know that's how this season really is and I for one can't wait for the next part but I feel like I'm really happy with how they left these four episodes and I think they've done a really great job of continuing the high standard that Bridgerton has set for itself let me know your theories for part two as well as the future of Bridgerton down below in the comments and be sure to subscribe if you want to see my eventual review of not only part two but any other Bridgerton content that I surely will be posting. Also, a major thank you to all of you who have supported my silly little reaction videos, um, especially those of you who are over on Instagram. That has meant the world to me. It has been really gratifying and really great to have this little Bridgerton community, and I am so thankful for all of you. So with all my love, I will see y'all in my very next video. Bye, guys.